And uh, so I think uh, we can now start officially with uh, the, the first uh, keynote. But first, I have to pass the baton to Jean Eno, uh, who will share the remaining part of today's event. So Dr. Jean Eno Charton is Director of Digital Ethics and Bioethics and is responsible for the Digital Ethics Strategy at Merck. He joined the company in 2014, and he has previously worked as the Chief of Staff to the Chief Medical Officer in Merck Healthcare. Uh, he holds a PhD degree in immuno-oncology from the University of Lausanne, Switzerland, and a graduate degree in biochemistry from the University of Tübingen in Germany. His research experience include Harvard Medical School and the Canadian Science Centre for Human and Animal Health. So it is a pleasure to pass the baton to him. Uh, we will see each other tomorrow again for the, the track on areas of application. I wish you all to enjoy the rest of uh, today's event and see you, uh, see you tomorrow. Bye bye. Magazzini um, around uh, explainable AI for intelligent financial uh, services. Um, and they, this is also for the human impact part. They will have uh, keynote two from Professor Andreas Dengel really on intelligence amplification and augmentation. Sorry, Jean I, I hear that maybe your audio is a bit too low. Okay, can you try again? We will try, we will try to fix this as soon as possible. possible. In the meantime, so I'll do the other audio. Maybe you can hear me now. Okay. Better now, can you hear me? Okay, very good. I'm sorry, this is all of an improvised setup. None of us have done this so far. Um, completely virtual, so it's the first all virtual Congress uh, for the GSI, ESA, and Merck together. Okay, so, so it's my honor really now, now to introduce, to introduce um, Daniele Magazzini. He's online, I can see him. He is a research director at JP Morgan for AI research, where he's also the head of the firmwide uh, explainable AI center of excellence. His main research interests uh, are AI, uh, in AI planning and machine learning. Uh, for efficient resource allocation and process optimization and explainable AI. Daniela, Daniela is the current president of International Conference and Automated Planning and Scheduling. He's also, also associate professor uh, at King's College in London, where he was the co-director of the UK Centre for Doctoral Training in Safe and Trusted AI and head of the Human AI Teaming Lab. So, hello, Daniela. I hope you can hear us. You should be able to unmute yourself and share your screen now. <laughs> yes. Can you hear me and see my slides? Hear him? Can you confirm that you can see my slides? Okay, great. Thanks. And hi, everyone. Uh, we can't hear you right now, um, Angela. Really? Okay. Very good. Go ahead. Okay, fine. Excellent. Hello, everyone, and uh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to join this uh, event. Um, so, yes, I'm uh, at JP Morgan at the moment. I joined two years ago after a career in academia, and I'm pleased to talk about what it means to do research in AI in JP Morgan, also following the title of this uh, event, so theory, uh, application, and research. And I think working uh, as a researcher at JP Morgan is a good example of how to mix these three together. So what I will do in the rest of this talk is to give you an overview uh, of some of the things we do uh, in AI at JP Morgan. And then in the second part, I will focus on explainable AI, also uh, focusing on the, the topic of this session, which is human impact. So what we try to do is to really to combine AI with uh, humans. Okay, but first of all, what is um, 
uh, JP Morgan, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, financial institutions. So JP Morgan is a, uh, an investment bank. And what is fascinating from an AI point of view is that JP Morgan is gigantic in terms of uh, uh, people involved. So we have 250,000 employees, of which 50,000 technology. So it's a very technology-focused company. And in terms of um, clients, we have several million clients um, around the globe. And every day we deal with uh, a huge amount of transactions, interactions, and uh, client interactions, stakeholder interactions. So the, the, from an AI point of view, what is fascinating is the concept of scaling. Every problem in JP Morgan is a huge problem in terms of scalability, which is where AI can really uh, contribute. Uh, what is AI research at JP Morgan? So, as you can imagine, there are several applied AI and data science teams in JP Morgan, but we are AI research where the goal is to really target long-term uh, problems that can take years to, to be solved and try to um, solve problems for which you need to advance the state of the art in AI. That's why we need to do research in order to solve uh, problems. And one thing I want to highlight, uh, which is not to be taken for granted, is that for us, AI is uh, broad. So it's not just uh, machine learning or deep learning, but it's also symbolic AI. It's also planning and optimization, formal methods, multi-agent systems, NLP, as well as XAI, which is an important part of what we do, as I will uh, say more about in, a, in, in the remaining of this talk. Okay, these are the what we call aspirational goals. Um, they drive um, what we, we do in our research. So we have seven goals, uh, three foundational topics. So AI to eradicate financial crime. And I'll try to give an example of some of these goals. Then AI to liberate data safely and AI to predict and affect economic systems. As you can imagine, there is a lot to be done with the, from an AI point of view in all these three uh, aspects. Then we have three goals dealing with stakeholders, so clients, employees, and regulators. So first of all, AI to perfect client experience, AI to empower employees, and here is where the focus on combining AI with human skills and human expertise, and then AI to agentize policy compliance. I'll give you an example of this goal as well. An important topic to highlight that was also mentioned in the earlier talks is that we have these uh, a cross-cutting theme, which is establish ethical and socially good AI. And this is really uh, dear to us. And it's something that um, it's critical for each of the previous aspirational goals I mentioned. Basically critical in everything we do. An ethical and socially good approach of AI. And on, from this point of view, explainable AI is a key uh, topic. Okay, uh, let's start with some examples. As I said, I'd like to give an overview also to give you the flavor of what it means to do research with an academic, with an academic background in, in a bank, in a financial institution. The first example I want to give is AI for fraud detection. You will see in the slides, I will mention some of uh, my collaborators who have been helping and actually driving the, the, the efforts in this topic. So AI for fraud detection. I want to start with a quote from um, a recent uh, report from UK Finance that as you can see here, they say that un unauthorized financial fraud losses across payment cards, remote banking and checks totaled more than 780 million in 2020. And uh, as you can see, frauds is still an important issue uh, that needs to be um, dealt with. Um, and clearly AI is used widely to try to um, detect frauds as best as possible. Um, and standard approaches are based on rule-based systems or classifiers that are basically used to identify fraudulent transactions. And if anyone is interested, there is also a public data set available, the IEEE fraud detection, that can be used to train models, mostly for anomaly detection. Again, the, the, the issue here is that the number of transactions every day is huge. Um, so identifying those who are fraudulent is not an easy task. AI is used for spotting anomalies. However, one of the main issues is that you need to manually inspect false positives because you don't want to stop what were uh, valid transactions. So typically a standard approach is used by classifiers. So you have data stream and classifications tells you which one are fraud and which are not fraud. 
The problem with what the, the ones who are classified as fraud is that, again, you need manual inspection to check that there are no false positive. Uh, the problem in this case is that uh, the number of manual inspections to be done is usually higher than the time and the people available. So the problem is, can we help the manual inspectors to identify those um, alerts which are most critical and most urgent? So the idea then is to transform the problem from show me every payment that you think is fraudulent to show me the most valuable or most important payment that I think I should check given the capacity to inspect. So it's a very concrete problem if you want, but from this problem, we come up with a general approach, which is sort of uh, job acceptance work. And we model this, and that was presented at EJKI uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we model this as non-parametric stochastic sequential assignment problem, uh, whereby the, the, the solution provided is this set of critical curves. These critical curves in different colors will be assigned to each of the uh, manual inspectors. And what these curves are saying is that each manual inspector at each given time should accept a job only if it's above the value of the critical curve. And this maximizes the reward that you get by selecting those tasks to be inspected. Uh, I mentioned in this example um, to, to give the idea that while we try to solve concrete problem, in this case fraud detection, we come up with the general setting that, that can be generalized and applied to other uh, problems. In this sense, uh, we do uh, publish papers, we do joint conferences, we are very much like a research uh, group. Clearly, we are driven by the needs of the um, business. Okay, another example is uh, synthetic data generation. Now, as you can imagine, uh, one uh, good point of being uh, a JP Morgan is the uh, availability of data. We have tons of data, but still uh, we work on generating synthetic data. And one might wonder why do you need to work on synthetic data given that you have this huge availability of uh, real data. And there are a number of reasons. Uh, well, first of all, uh, clearly, real data are, um, are very, very valuable. Um, however, there are situations where actually you, you can't use real data for uh, regulatory restrictions or because it's difficult to share data across a large organization. Um, most important, though, is also the case that in real data, you might miss what are uh, rare events, which are important from a risk management point of view. You want to be able to identify um, unusual cases, which are also important to, to be able to deal with. Um, and that the solution to this problem is to generate synthetic data. Uh, the idea is to come up with the data that are synthetic, so not real, but very, very similar to the real ones. And uh, I want to highlight this, which is a um, public uh, available uh, set of synthetic data. So you can visit this uh, um, website where you will find information about AI research and among initiatives, the synthetic data, you find these four sets of synthetic data about markets execution, payment data for fraud detection that I mentioned earlier, customer journals, and anti-money laundering. Um, I just want to give you the flavor of how we approach the problem of generating data. Uh, there are three main approaches. Clearly, the first one is based on anonymization of real data or sampling. Uh, the second approach is sampling from learned models. And the third approach, which I think is relatively new and we introduced, is based on either uh, multi-agent simulation or planning. Um, clearly, you see the requirement here. The key point is that the data you generate should be as much as possible similar to the, to the real ones. I want to give you a brief example um, on how we use uh, planning for generating synthetic data. So this is the process. And what I want to highlight here is that you need to come up with the metrics to assess the real data and metrics to assess synthetic data and check that those are similar. If not, you need to refine and revisit the way you generate synthetic data. In terms of using planning, um, planning is a model-based uh, approach whereby you specify the set of actions that a system can take you specify the initial state and the goal you want to achieve. And what planning does, mostly using search, is to explore the set of alternative ways of achieving a goal 
and come up with a set of actions that represent the plan. This approach can be used to generate traces, which is very relevant when it comes to um, synthetic data. And what we did is to use a uh, planning for synthetic data about anti-money laundering. So the, the, the idea here is that you can uh, create plans representing the good behavior and bad behavior. So um, here on top, you see a, a plan that shows what could be a money laundering behavior. So you have actions that money laundering can take and the plan generates uh, plans that corresponds to trace of money laundering behavior. Similarly, you can have also legitimate operations and what you do, uh, the beauty of using planning is that you can create millions of such tra traces very fast and create um, a vast amount of uh, traces that then you can use to train in a model, for example. It's important well, that you need to synthesize both bad behaviors and good behavior in order to have a representative set of uh, data. Um, this is an example of uh, synthetic data we generate, which is very close to what actually the, the, the real data look like. Uh, similarly, we use a multi-agent based simulation approach and I want to highlight this uh, multi-agent simulator, Abytes, which is open source and is available. And the idea is that you can simulate a uh, huge amount of agents in the trading and market space and in this way simulate a different behavior of many, many agents. And this is an example of how we um, simulate real data from NASDAQ and create synthetic data that are really similar to the uh, real ones. Again, I'm not going to the details. I hope the goal of this talk is to uh, give you a flavor and then I'll be happy to follow up uh, offline and also explore uh, collaborations. Okay, another stream is AI to agentize policy compliance. What I want to uh, highlight here is that um, in JP Morgan, as in many other institutions, we work um, you know, close with uh, domain experts, with um, decades of experience and a lot of uh, um, expertise in the domains. And clearly we don't, we can't, and we don't want to replace them, but rather to leverage their knowledge and create a sort of human AI teaming approach. An example is AI to agentize policy compliance. So very briefly, as you can imagine, uh, a financial institution is really uh, highly regulated and uh, there are many, many uh, legal sources um, and uh, people need to check that every process in the firm is compliant to all these many uh, regulators. And this is done mostly manually by humans. A lot of people in compliant teams checking that everything we do is compliant with tons of regulators or regulations that also keep growing and changing over time. So the goal of, with these uh, Again, aspirational goals, we are not there yet, it'll take a while, but this is the vision, is to come up with an AI framework that can help in three ways. First of all, organizing and structuring this uh, huge amount of legal sources. It's uh, uh, important to note how time consuming is to navigate this huge set of legal obligations. So we want to use AI to be able to cluster and help humans to get sense of uh, legal obligation faster and uh, better. What you see here is uh, every dot of a color represents a set of regulations which refers to a specific uh, lines of business or a specific topic. The second stream, bottom right, is uh, um, how to transform uh, text, say English, into uh, a more human readable form in terms of helping humans to get faster uh, what they need to find. So, for example, comprehensive alerts on changes, for example, on regulations or risk analysis or regulation requirements, human uh, judgment. And this introduced me to the third point, which I'll, I'll, I'll say a bit more in a minute, which is how to translate what is, say, natural English, for example, into a representation that machines can understand and reason with. And this is an example of what we are doing. Um, again, I'll give you the flavor. Um, so we have one example of regulation, which refers to shares buyback, which means what uh, companies can purchase of their own common stock. And you see four items of this regulation in English. The first step is to translate from natural language into logic-based representation. And this uh, happens in three steps. So we start with general language. 
we move into control language, which is a subset of natural language with categories. And we translate this into contact logic, which is a, a logic that allows you to specify what must be done, what cannot be done, includes more operators that are, um, allows modeling of contracts. When we have this contact logic representation of the natural language uh, rule, we can then create automatically a finite state machine that can interpret this logic-based representation. Once we have this finite state machine, the next step is to code, again, this can be done automatically, uh, code the finite state machine into, in this case, the simulator that we I mentioned before, the electronic market simulator, and basically include in the simulator this sort of referee that checks whether the transaction, again, in the simulator environment, are compliant to this regulation, as well as many others that we have in our simulator. Again, this is still a, a early stage. It's a difficult goal to achieve. That's why it's a research. We need to uh, work hard on this, but this shows the direction we are pursuing in the space of AI to agentize policy compliance. Um, just to mention, because it's very timely, how AI is helping in JP Morgan to handle the uh, return to the office after the pandemic. So as in many other institutions, there is a smart working or hybrid working, people rotating between the office and the working from home. Clearly, uh, with 250,000 employees, the problem becomes uh, challenging and also gives opportunity to use AI for real estate optimization. And so um, how to reduce the real estate footprint, and we are using AI for that. We are using a, a planning and scheduling to solve a uh, resource allocation problem. So the input is the resource that you have to allocate and then a set of constraints. And the AI will tell you whether there is an assignment that satisfies all the constraints. If not, it will tell you how, either how to relax constraints so that the feasible assignment exists or how you should have additional resources in order to satisfy the constraints. Now, in the context of uh, returning to the office, uh, an example is that you have an, a limited number of desks in each group and some sort of requirements. How many days people want to be back in the office, when they want to be back in the office. And the goal is to try to satisfy as much as possible all the employees' preferences, which is not easy because clearly uh, there are conflicting preferences in large organizations. Uh, one point I want to mention is uh, fairness. And just to give an example, Mm, uh, pr probably most people would like to work from home on Fridays and you don't want to send all the same people on Fridays in the office. So that's just one example of fairness constraints. And AI is pretty, uh, you know, great in reasoning in terms of fairness that otherwise will be very time consuming and difficult for um, humans. So we are working on these and clearly there are research uh, challenges in terms of scalability, uh, again, how to improve fairness, also how to explain the fairness of the proposed schedule without disclosing employees' preferences. There are a lot of research questions that are at least fascinating for me and, and my team. We scale up then this, and we moved into uh, scheduling single teams into scheduling large buildings in order to, again, optimize uh, real estate optimization. And again, AI is great in automatizing a lot of this uh, process and also offering what-if scenarios so that People can reason in terms, what if I have 60% of the population in my office or 70%? What are the what if uh, scenarios that I can uh, analyze? Okay, uh, second part of the talk, I will now focus on uh, explainable AI center of excellence. In everything we do, um, it's crucial that we are able to give insights on how the AI uh, algos and models work. Uh, crucially, uh, particularly in a financial institution, explainable AI is really crucial for uh, at least four points of view. First of all, our customers, those who are subject to decision made by the AI, for regulators, given that uh, financial institutions are highly regulated, uh, practitioners, by which I mean the, the actual users in the firm of AI models from all sorts of uh, uh, applications, and finally, from a risk management point of view. Um, so clearly with the use of AI, there are a lot of potentials, but there are also a lot of uh, new risks that needs to be uh, mitigated. XAI can help there. Now, we do a lot of things on XAI. I will mention a few things. And for those that want to really acknowledge, these people are the people who are helping in the examples I'll be uh, showing. So 
kudos to the to the team really okay the first thing we did um so uh, first of all jp morgan created this uh, explainable ai center of excellence mid last year that i have the, the honor to lead exactly for um putting together all the efforts around explainability and really push forward the research agenda on xai the first thing we did was to come up with this taxonomy of types of explanations in finance and the first thing to note is that explanations are clearly dependent on the target. Uh, you should change explanation depending on who you are trying to explain things to. The first type of explanation is actionable recourses. And the typical uh, un question we try to answer is why do you reject my loan application? And particularly, what should I do so the next time I get uh, I apply, I get it approved? Um, so basically, when people apply for loan or for credit card, uh, financial institution must provide them reasons why uh, the loan was rejected. So when it comes to using AI, you need to ask the AI algo why that was rejected. I'll give you an example on this. Again, so the target in this case are the consumers of AI models, meaning the, 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 the customers, for example. The second type of explanation is explanation is diagnostic, and the idea is to help developers of AI to, to understand better how the, work, the algorithm uh, works. And clearly questions are, how does the algorithm work internally? Uh, or what are the main drivers of this uh, model? Uh, finally, there are uh, explanations that are used for verification and testing. So from a risk management point of view, it is uh, very important to be able to assess whether the model is compliant in stress test situations. Uh, think about, I don't know, models using algo trading um, with the potential huge impact. So it's important to make sure that we have, we, we can test the robustness of these algos and also to identify how they would behavior, behave in stress test situations, so in very extreme cases. Uh, more broadly, again, for those who are not familiar maybe with explainable AI, we distinguish between global explanations, whereby the goal is to try to explain the overall behavior of a model versus local explanations, whereby the goal is to explain a specific uh, decision that or prediction that the model made. Um, finally, we distinguish between post hoc explanations, which means you take an existing model and you try to apply techniques to explain why the model is behaving in a particular way versus inherently interpretable models, whereby the goal is to come up with models that are intrinsically interpretable. So uh, th there is a way to uh, clearly understand what they are, how they are uh, reasoning. Okay, the main, uh, the first of main approach for um, a, as a post doc, post hoc explainability is feature importance. The goal here is to try to um, identify um, what are the main uh, drivers of the model. So if your model is having tons, a lot of features, you want to identify what are the, the features that have a, a, the highest impact on the decisions of the model. And typically you get a, a plot like this, where in the Y axis you have the features and in X axis you have a measure of the impact of those features in the model. And this helps you, for example, to identify if the main drivers are the ones that are in line with the human intuition or whether there is some surprising uh, main driver that you would not uh, expect. There are a couple of standard um, methods um, very well widely used uh, in many uh, in research as well as in um, um, financial institution. One is LIME, where in a nutshell, the idea is to try to um, approximate a model with a linear model in neighbors. So you get uh, uh, an explanation locally. Uh, the second approach is SHAP, whereby the goal is to um, model the behavior of the features as a game. Uh, and then you use cooperative game theory, typically called SHAP values, to identify the contribution of each feature to the model. Um, they can be used both for global explanations. Uh, the idea is to say, OK, give me a, a, an overview globally of what are the main drivers of the model or for local explanation, meaning for this particular decision, these were the features that, you know, were the main responsibles for, for such a decision. For example, for denying, rejecting a loan application. Um, now, 
there are one sort of some research we did is that, as I said, Sharper uh, is very popular. Uh, we did some research on different ways of using Sharp, of using feature importance. Now, uh, this scheme try to um, summarize the behavior of this uh, approach. So uh, let's assume that, that, that we are in the following situation. Uh, I am a customer X applying for a loan, say, and this is the decision boundary and I was rejected. Okay, so this uh, the left uh, downside is rejected and the other one are rejected. Now, we want to provide reasons to, this, uh, to, to, me, to, my, to me as a customer on why I was rejected. Now, one approach, one way of using SHARP is to consider a reference point in red and try to identify the difference between myself and this reference point. Now, clearly, uh, the way you choose the reference point is uh, crucial uh, in uh, with, with kind of explanation you provide. One could, for example, identify the reference point as the best customer who applied for a loan, okay? And they will tell me, okay, the difference between you and the best customer is this. So you should try to, uh, you know, close this gap. That's one way. Another way is to take every single point or a large set of points in the training set and average them and say how different I am from the average uh, point. Uh, what we are instead um, trying to pursue is what we call counterfactual sharp, which is in orange here. I hope you can see the different colors. That is the following. I've been rejected. I'm X and I've been rejected. What we want to try to do is to identify a oh, set of customers who were accepted, but who are similar to me. So try to identify those who are uh, less different than me so that it's easier for me to close the gap with them. And the idea here is to help customers to improve their profile. Again, this is to highlight how uh, the same approach can be used in different ways and give different type of explanation. So it's important what you have, uh, what's your goal is in providing the explanation. In this case, in our case, is to help our customers. Uh, another example of SHARP, this is a, a model uh, we uh, trained to see how um, we react to market volatility. So this is in the, for example, in the trading space. And the idea is what happened uh, to market volatility when COVID hit. And you see here, the rectangle starts uh, February uh, 2020, which is when COVID hit Saturday, hit, at least in the UK. Uh, what you see here is on top, the plot showing the, fee the value of a feature. And you see a big change when COVID hit, which is not surprising. However, we can measure this difference. And in the uh, bottom plot, you see a, a plot related to the same feature, but now showing the impact of that feature into the model. And what is interesting to see is that uh, although there is a change when COVID hit, the change in the impact is not so higher than we see in the change in the value, which might suggest that model needs to be, for example, recalibrated. So it's an, an interesting example of how explanations can help in the diagnosis of model behaviors particularly over time with uh, changes in the conditions. Uh, the last topic I want to uh, touch upon is counterfactual explanations. Now, uh, counterfactual explanations try to answer the following question. Uh, given an input, an output, and given an input, um, how should the input change so that I get a different output? Now, in the Classification example, for example, um, uh, credit card application, if I get rejected, the counterfactual explanation means how should my profile be different so that my application gets approved instead? These are the counterfactual explanations, uh, which are very, you know, used in a, a classification, which means how to flip basically the outcome of the binary classifications. And this is what graphically looks like. Again, X is the data point. And I can come up with two counterfactual where I uh, go, uh, I, I, I move beyond uh, the decision boundary. Uh, however, one issue is that I could remain in the data manifold or go outside the data manifold. So there are different ways to generate counterfactual explanations. Now, uh, I want to make four considerations, which for us is very important. And I think they are all uh, interesting research directions, I believe. First of all, it's crucial to um, reason in terms of actionability of uh, explanations. For example, uh, the, the, the counterfactual explanation, which means what you should change, must be actionable. I cannot tell any uh, customer you should be 
10 years younger to get a credit card. So this is not actionable. Instead, I want to focus on what is actionable. Uh, however, uh, measuring actionability is challenging as it's not always obvious. For some um, customers, it can be easy to change X uh, versus changing Y, where X and Y are two different features. So it's not, it's a research challenge to identify what constitute a more uh, actionable explanations. Uh, the second challenge is robustness of explanations. The goal here is that if I tell a customer you need to change this in order for your application to get approved, I want to make sure if, that if the customer applies in one month uh, from now, uh, that explanation is still valid. Okay, And that's important because in a sense, uh, the more you explain, the more you commit to the, to, to the behavior of a model. And given that models change because you retrain models, because condition around change, um, assessing the robustness of explanation is an important uh, research question. Again, it's crucially important from a business point of view because you, you provide explanation to customers and you want them to be solid over time, but it's a research question. So it's a nice combination of how we need to do research in order to address a business need. Uh, the third point is effectiveness of explanations. As I mentioned earlier, explanations are for, for humans. Uh, so you want humans really to get uh, benefits from the explanation, to really understand the explanation. Therefore, user must be at the center of the research we do. In this sense, we partnered in JP Morgan with, between AI Research and a, a team specialized in user experience. And they help us with uh, user studies, with also defining in the best way, the, even the interface that you use to visualize explanation. So the way you visualize explanation is really important. Also because, and this is uh, interesting, we work with people, think about people in the trading floor, they are already dealing with a huge amount of information. They have, you know, seven screens, they look at plenty of data. Explanations must be visualized in a way which is well integrated uh, with the rest of the information that they must absorb. So it's an important challenge from uh, how you combine AI contribution with the humans. It's really an important synergy, which is you know, fascinating from a research point of view. Uh, finally, counterfactual for regression models. The problem is that when you have classification, where the output is yes or not, for example, accept or reject, this setting is much different than regression models where the output is a number. So the potential um, counterfactual, the set of counterfactual is really difficult to uh, navigate. Um, again, in the interest of time, I will be very uh, quick on this, but it's a recent contribution uh, we come up with a, a novel uh, technique for providing counterfactual explanations for arbitrary regression models. Um, you can find there is the detail of the paper. So the idea is that, again, in counterfactual search for a classification problem, the goal is to find an instance which is very similar to my, to, to the original data point, but such that the output is flipped, okay? Um, and here you see the banal classification example. In the scalar regression case, is not the same because I still want a query instance which is uh, a minimal perturbation of the original data point. Uh, however, the output must always be within different within a bound that I specify. Um, I don't have the, the, the time to go into the details, just to say that we, we apply the Bayesian optimization approach where we train a surrogate Gaussian process and we repeat training and sampling until we converge. And there are um, proofs of the convergence of the algorithm. Uh, the code is open source. I just want to give you a sense of uh, what the, 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 the output uh, look like. Now, what you see here is four examples of counterfactuals. And uh, again, the regression model here was opting a, a number, and we wanted to come up with um, four, well, counterfactuals that were um, producing an output within 7% of the original value, okay? And what you see here, there are four ways of achieving this difference within 7%, and considering focusing on three features, you see how the features should change so that you get the difference that you were uh, aiming for. Uh, clearly, there is a scalability issues. And the idea is that we, we are able to focus 
on a subset of features, perhaps the most relevant, depending on the use case, and you allow the user to explore uh, the set of uh, what-if scenarios. And this is, again, uh, one example, but this approach is uh, uh, agnostic about the, the, the model used. So you might use this with XGBoost as well with neural networks. It's very, uh, is a model independent. And again, you can look uh, for the paper if you're interested in the uh, technical details. And if you want to get the code, please get in touch. Uh, again, I want to thank all these people who have been working on the use cases I mentioned. And uh, I want to finish with a, a couple of uh, um, announcements, if, if I may. So this relates to last year, we organized the first uh, international conference on AI in finance. Uh, the reason for that is that there, there is, well, there was no conference specifically focused on AI in finance. And this is the first one we organized, it was a, a very big success. And the reason why I'm mentioning that is that the new one, the 2021 is uh, upcoming, will be from 3rd to 5th of November. It was supposed to be in Oxford, will be virtual for obvious reasons. And as part of this conference, we are organizing with the colleagues from CMU, Harvard and Imperial College, the first international workshop focused on XAI in finance. The deadline is upcoming, but still you are interested in participating, please uh, get in touch. And the website for this overall conference is ai.finance.org. Last, I want to highlight the fact that um, we are hiring at JP Morgan. So if there are people interested, either students uh, and we also have the JP Morgan Faculty Research Awards. We fund research with faculties. So we are very much interested in collaboration with academia. Please do get in touch if you are interested in collaboration. We are very keen to engage. And also, if you have any questions or you want to have a deep dive, please follow up with my team. We are very keen to uh, collaborate and follow up. I'll stop here. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Daniela. Very interesting. Okay, thank you very much. Following up on this, um, just we have a few questions. I mean, we can see questions coming in now already. I mean, and if anybody wants to pose more questions, we have the Q and A uh, box. The question and answers actually on the bottom. What we have here is, um, is one question, for example, from Kevin Garcia. He asks, how do we standardize testing systems across the global banks? Yeah, that's a, a very good question. Um, I, I will take this question from two angles. First of all, um, I will talk about the fact that I believe that in AI, one critical um, topic is knowledge representation. Uh, how to represent information in a different way, uh, including a standard way. So uh, being able, for example, in a bank, you deal with uh, forms on all sort of uh, different template. Be able to come up with standardized format for those will be amazing in terms of optimization and uh, automation of process, process automations. So that's the first angle in terms of standardizing the representation of um, information. The second is uh, sharing information across banks would be really, um, is really important. Uh, think about uh, fraud detection. If you are able to share information about fraud detection, it will increase. Clearly one issue is that it's not easy to share data across banks, uh, but promising direction that we are exploring, I didn't have time to mention, but we are exploring the use of federated learning to really facilitate this uh, uh, sharing of um, information across uh, banks and across institutions in the financial domain. But yes, I do agree that standardization is a key topic. Thanks for the comment. Okay. And then we have a question from Benjamin uh, Yildiz, and he's asking, is such an ex AI explanation accepted or well received? How is the perception from the outside world? Yeah, that's a great question. So first of all, um, I would take the question whether it's uh, accepted internally uh, at JP Morgan. Um, yes, it is well accepted. However, in order to be well accepted, uh, as I mentioned, the partnership with um, user experience teams is crucial. 
uh, and also I guess the mess the message is important. Which message are we conveying? So first of all, I don't think we are explaining everything, okay? Because uh, I, I mentioned feature importance. You can't reduce the complexity of a ML model into feature importance only. So the message is that we are providing insights to the domain experts for them to increase their trust and confidence in the model. But I believe that the right match should not be that, yes, we explain everything about the model. That would not be, uh, I think, uh, fair or the right message to give. Um, second is really to be able to identify what the real questions from the users are. So what they really need to understand. Again, because they are already uh, dealing with a, a huge amount of information. So you want to make sure that what you provide is what they really need and you are not uh, adding uh, uh, information uh, load uh, to what they can um, they can absorb. Um, outside world, well, yes, this is, uh, um, I mean, we are publishing on these uh, topics. Again, the problem is that explanations depend, strongly depends on the target, okay? Um, what we come up with recently, this technique on counterfactual is agnostic about the model. My intuition is that you can use this uh, technique with any model, but then you still have to make the step to uh, understand with the target what they really need in terms of questions they want to explain and the way you want to visualize and communicate uh, this ex explanation. This is uh, crucial, I believe. Okay, thank you. And then uh, also have a question from Artyom Poslowski, he's asking, do you think supervising authorities could access in compliance uh, levels with machine learning? Is this something that's possible? And this is the coming view, you can see the ESA impact. Do you believe anonymous detection algorithms from space domain could be an inspiration or solution for that challenge? That's a very interesting question. I take the second one and I'd say, yes, definitely. Let's uh, talk, Arthur. Um, I really, I, I also came from academia where I was doing planning for robotics. So how do you see a, a roboticist in a, in a bank it can be um, weird. weird. Uh, however, for example, I've been working a lot on uh, planning um, whereby you search across graphs. And if you think about the payments, billions of payments every day, these after all are huge graphs. So we were able to leverage what I was doing with the planning the logistic problems and robotics into finance. This is to say that, yeah, I believe that AI can really learn from, I mean, we can learn from each other in our uh, domains where we, where we apply AI, because again, you want to solve a specific problem, but you generalize to a research technique that is general and can be used in other domains. So definitely, I love to share knowledge and insights also from what you get on anomaly detection from space domain, because anomaly detection is really something very important for us. So yes, I'm happy to talk. Okay, and so then something that's also really comes from my side of work, it's um, what are ethical components of such systems and if present, how are they managed, obviously? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as I mentioned, one of our aspirational goals, which is actually a cross-cutting theme, is ethical and socially good AI. For example, fairness, is uh, crucial and what we do with the explainable AI center of excellence is to make sure that our models do not discriminate so for example discrimination is really something we must avoid and we do everything we do for that so we check for bias in any of our models clearly and again there um, one thing to highlight is that explanations clearly is very tightly coupled with uh, fairness because every do we everything we do on explainability to, uh, to help diagnose model's behavior is very beneficial from a fairness and bias point of view because you get insights that can help you identify whether there are issues that you really uh, must fix. So yes, fairness and ethical AI is absolutely critical for us at JP Morgan. Very good. Thank you very much for that. And thank you very much for the inspiring talk. I think that's very thank received. You. There's quite some questions still on, so people might try to contact you on Umbrella later on. Please follow up. Thank you very much everyone for listening.